podcast, Truth Seekers Podcast. Buckle up, everyone. We're going to talk aliens, UFOs, ghosts, spiritual, and paranormal from all of the three moons. On your wildest dreams. Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Truth Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Truth Seeker. Excited and delighted to be with you guys again today. Got an awesome show lined up for you all. It's going to be really good. Excited about this. Um, Got a couple things I need to get out the way first and let you guys know about what we got going on. September the 14th, we have the Christ Consciousness Conference here in Mobile, Alabama. So this is something that we're putting on ourselves. Uh, we got people driving from all over the country to be there. So if you would like to uh, be a part of it, if you'd like to come and check it out, you can go to Christ-Consciousness.com to get tickets. Tickets are 25 bucks. If you're not able to uh, be there in person, there's live stream options and all that good stuff available as well. So Christ-Consciousness.com. Or you can go to truthseeker.com as well. The info is there. So I'm going to be performing. We're going to be doing some music. We're going to be talking about sound healing, vibration, color healing, light, all that good stuff. And we're going to get to experience that as well. Some singing bowls and chanting and stuff like that. It's going to be awesome. We also have um, Joshua Fluman, a.k.a. Gothic Mystic, will be there. He's going to be uh, talking about dream interpretation and symbolism. Um my good friend Justin Caldwell will be playing the piano, uh, ministering that way and uh, playing the piano prophetically over us. And it's going to be awesome. September 14th, Mobile, Alabama. Make sure you guys check that out. I um, want to say a huge thank you again to everybody who has supported my work via Patreon. This podcast would not be possible without your help and support. So thank you guys again from the bottom of my heart. Everybody who's been supporting since day one, you know who you are. Most of your names are scrolling at the bottom of the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, But I want to give a huge shout out to some of the newest patrons we have within the last week or so. Shout out to Gene Gonzalez. Thank you for coming on, believing in the vision. And Jerry Lomax. Shout out to you too. Uh, If you'd like to support, head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music you get access to our thursday night school of the mystics we do a sunday morning seer class for a small group of people and a bunch of really cool stuff that we're bringing to the table um i actually just uploaded the rest of my uh collection to the the patreon so literally there's over 200 songs there my entire discography go over there check it out and uh yeah help yourself patreon.com backslash true seeker Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring in today's guest. Joining me today on the podcast is Celine Williams. Celine, how are you, my friend? Welcome to the podcast. 
Hi, I am fine, thank you. I'm fine. And I'm here uh, in Switzerland today. <laughs> the weather is good, everything is nice, uh, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh, well, thank you. I'm in Mobile, Alabama, and the uh, weather is not that nice. It's raining, it's dark outside, and it's early in the morning, but I am as well excited to be here with you guys. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to this discussion. Do you want to introduce your son as well? Oh, yes, I'm here with my son, who helps me a lot in my job because he knows the Russian perfectly. Actually, he got his degree in Russian from Cambridge University, and now he's studying anthropology, or always at Cambridge. And he helps me a lot because uh, I work uh, usually with uh, Siberian shamans. I go to Siberia two times uh, per year. And uh, he helped me to understand this incredible women and men <laughs> which live in the steppes and make uh, incredible, amazing things. Um, uh, now they they founded um, uh, a few months ago. They founded a shaman uh, union um, in order to help uh, uh, to save the nature. Um, you know that um, uh, in Siberia the forests are burning, and uh, this is a really ecological disaster for our planet. And uh, this is why the shamans uh, have decided to found this uh, shaman union. And uh, I am a part of it. Me and my son, we are part of it. And we want to really help, help nature. And um, from, from a shaman perspective, the best thing to do to help nature is uh, help human beings to change their uh, thinking method, which is not just a mindset, but the thinking method, and uh, try to think in a different way, try to see that uh, the multitude is in the one and the one is in the multitude, try to see that the things, events, Happen not because they have the causes, but because they have uh, ends, they have goals. And um, you see, <laughs> my, my great friend uh, Kazimir, who is a Siberian powerful shaman, always says that we can't, we can't help nature and our own bodies with the same tools. Uh, with with which uh, with what sorry we destroyed them we destroyed the planet we destroyed our bodies and so we have to change the tools and the tool of the tools is our thinking method so <laughs> we are here to give an help a little help to this uh, enormous uh, uh, mission <laughs> yeah yeah, and, and so just changing the consciousness of the planet, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for those people who are here with us, and we're talking about shamans and shamanism, uh, for people who don't know what, what that is, can you unpack that a little bit? What is a shaman? <laughs> the, the, the word the shaman means the one who knows, and um, shaman um, are um, people who, who live uh, all over the world, and uh, they are um, um, people very close to nature. They are um, uh, animists, and they see God in nature. When they say. Uh, when they pray God, they pray the rain, they pray the wolf, they pray the um, uh, owl <laughs> or the earth, the water, they see gods everywhere. And, um, and they, 
they are able to see simultaneously the two aspects of reality, the visible and the invisible. The main uh, job of a shaman is uh, the, the shaman journey, which is um, a journey across the great threshold. The great threshold is the threshold between uh, visible and invisible, life and death, conscious and unconscious. And being a psychology as well, I really um, appreciate this uh, ability to cross the great treasure. And uh, I developed myself this ability um, because I think it is the most important psychological act that a therapist uh, can do. <laughs> you see, crossing the great treasure and um, take uh, someone with you um, is a great therapeutic action. Don't you agree, Michelangelo? Yeah, yeah because basically uh, the, the, the main, if we could translate sort of in Western language, the social purpose of a shaman uh, at the end is, is that of healing people. That's the main function within, within a community. And um, the shaman does this by performing what my mom called the shamanic journey, um, because, uh, I mean, the, the shaman is basically what, what the ancients, the ancient Greeks called a psychopomp, a ferryman between um, what could be called the, the, the world of the living or the world of the dead, the world of the spirits and the world of, of, of us humans. So in a certain sense, the shaman is, in, is a, um, a, a bridge between um, different worlds. Now, in most uh, Siberian shamanic traditions, they, they believe there are three levels of, of the world. There is an upper level of, of, of spirits, there is the middle earth, you could say, where we, which we inhabit, and there is an underworld where, where, where demons, uh, you could say, uh, live. Yes, yes. And um, you see, in one of these three worlds, uh, every, everyone has um, 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 a bride or a, or a groom, you see. This is why uh, the center of uh, shamanic thought is uh, the mystical, the so-called mystical marriage. And um, I wrote a book about that, about the mystical marriage, which is entitled uh, The Mada Mantra, The Shamanic Yoga of Non-Duality. And um, this book was published um, in English by Inner Traditions. So it's available on Amazon uh, and even in the bookshops in, uh, in, in the US. Um, and... Um, in this book, I explain how to enter the mystical marriage, which is a, a very powerful and happy condition to be. Um, for the ancients, um, was um, eudaimonia. The word eudaimonia in Greek means being in companion of a good diamond, with a good diamond, with a good guide spirit. Spirit, having a good guy spirit with you uh, really changes all your life and makes everything uh, at ease. Don't you agree, Mickey? Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's awesome. So, a shaman essentially, a person who is able to bridge the gap between the two worlds. Um, let me ask you this. So you mentioned, I said two worlds, three worlds, as, as, as you guys put it. So is there, um, just because you have the uh, Middle Earth where we are, then you have the angels and the demons, are the demons in the underworld, is that necessarily bad? Or do the demons assist us and, and help us in things as well? No, no, uh, definitely. Uh, all, of, all the animistic traditions, I would say, do, do, do not have a... In, I could say a, 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 a vertical view of the world, but rather a horizontal view. So uh, this 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 world structure lacks a, a sort of ethical uh, value. It's not to say that the underworld of demons is necessarily evil, and and the the world above is good. 
I must say that um, in, in, in the last few centuries, because shamanism, at least in Siberia, has, has undergone a lot of influence of uh, um, Buddhism, Islam, and uh, especially Orthodox Christianity, moral um, uh, concepts that belong to these religions have uh, uh, sort of uh, got into, into shamanism quite a lot. So you will meet a lot of shamans that have this view that the demons are bad, the, 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 the spirits of the, of the upper world are good, and um, generally shamans divide themselves into different, um, at least in Siberia again, they divide themselves into black shamans, um, white shamans, then there are also yellow shamans that are Buddhist shamans, but generally the black shamans deal with the forces of the underworld. Uh, and the white shamans deal instead with, uh, you could say, celestial forces. And nowadays there is this uh, assumption that black shamans are sort of um, um, involved in witchcraft uh, and uh, and uh, sort of negative uh, forces. Curses and things like that. Exactly, exactly. Whilst the white shamans are, are the good ones, the healers, that is not true. Absolutely not true. Uh, it is um, uh, traditionally, uh, it, it's, it's simply shamans that have, um, you could say, different specialities that deal with the different uh, types of uh, illnesses um, and, and, and have uh, performed different ritual purposes in the community. But uh, as I said, with, with the influx of, of, of different moral yeah. systems, this, this perception has changed. With, um, you know, you mentioned Christianity and Islam and some of these other moral traditions kind of kind of sinking in. And I think that there's just a piece of shamanism in all those religions as well. If for someone who is like a follower of the Christian path, right, um, it's it's it, the, the shamanism go against their traditional beliefs. Or would you say that looking at the scriptures in the life of Jesus was G, was Jesus a shaman? Oh, for me, Jesus was a shaman, definitely. <laughs> I'm writing a book about uh, Mary Magdalene now. And uh, <laughs> so I, I went uh, deep down in this topic. And uh, I definitely see Jesus as a shaman. Um, you see, a shaman is also someone who can... Uh, perceive reality not only through his uh, thinking or her thinking mind but also with uh, her or his heart you see we have also an a thought of the art not only a thought of it of the mind we also have a thought of the art and a shaman is someone who can think through his or her heart, not only through his or her mind. And Jesus was definitely a shaman uh, from uh, this point of view, you see. And um, he was a kneeler, and um, <laughs> his way of feeling was definitely uh, similar to the way of feeling uh, of a shaman. And um, and he crossed the great threshold and he came back as, as exactly as the, the shamans do. <laughs> you see. Yeah, there's something that is 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 known as the shamanic death and stuff as well, right? Oh yes, yes. I wrote a book also about that, <laughs> but unfortunately, it's still not yet translated in uh, in English. Uh, has been translating in other languages, but not in English yet. And um, I wrote a book about uh, shamanic death, um, which is um, a ritual, a ritual that uh, every real shaman has to perform before to become a shaman. It's a ritual of uh, death, uh, die and be reborn, die and be reborn. And um, is a really great and powerful ritual which changes uh, all your perspective. Uh, you see, I think that until, until 
um, an individual has not uh, um, died and be reborn, he continues to be unhappy and unsatisfied in this planet Earth. Um, the death in life, the death in life is a really a key to shift from um, suffering, pain, illusions uh, to um, another completely different wave of uh, perception where uh, um, pain uh, is not suffering but is uh, um, powerful and uh, energy at a very high level. Another way of perceiving reality where uh, uh, limitations are opportunities um, and even death is not uh, an end, but just uh, a transformation, you see, um, is a question of awareness. Um, um, we, um, I think that human beings, uh, the, the present human beings, are full of fear, are full of fear because they live in a dual state of consciousness where uh, um, uh, underworld is uh, uh, distincting and separated from the upper world is not true. Underworld is, is distinct but not separated from the upper world. And so are bad and good, which are distinct but not separated. But if you live in a world where bad and good, underworld and upper world are distinct and separated, then you live full of fear. You are full of fear every time. Uh, of, of course, because you you are in fear of bad, <laughs> and um, if you are full of fear, you can't awake your real potential, your real possibilities. If you are full of fear, your uh, inner senses are contracted and closed, and so you can't see the invisibility. You can't see what is hidden to the normal senses. And if you can't see what is hidden to the normal senses, of course you, you die. <laughs> of course you die. Um, you, you finish, you end, because at the moment of dying, you can't perceive your consciousness, which must be um, continuous between life and death, visible and invisible, um, interrupts, uh, interrupts, cut off. cut off, cut off itself um, because of fear, you see. Because of fear, human beings are forced to have a death like an end because they are not able to be aware on the other side of the great treasure. And so they have the impression that death is the end of everything. But it's not. If you can be aware, if you can see, if you can perceive here and there in the both sides of the great treasure, so you perfectly you are perfectly able to understand that death is not an end. Death is just love, as everything in this world. Everything is love in this world. And Jesus is, a, is, is the greatest teacher of that. So he is the greatest shaman that we can refer to. You, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm with you on that, too. It almost seems like, you know, we hear terms like as above, so below, as within, so without. Like there's this mirror image and it almost seems like the two realms, you know, uh, the heaven and, and, and hell or the above and be below. They're almost like mirror images of, of one another, wouldn't you say? Yes, 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 yes. Do you want to say something? No, 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 I completely agree. Yes, yes, I think that's that's exactly the point uh, uh, that that my mom was going, was trying to get across, uh, uh, and and what, what 
what the essence of, 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 of shamanism is, at least. You see, at the time of Omiro, Omiro, Homer, 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 at the time of Homer, um, only underworld existed, and everyone after death joined the underworld. The upper world entered in the uh, humanity um, unconscious only later with Virgilius. Virgil. Virgil, with Virgil. But uh, before uh, the Homer, Homer times, uh, um, um, there were only the inf inferior world, which, is, which has not to be seen as uh, um, inferior, but as interior, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and um, paradise and hell, the division, the separation between paradise and hell is recently, recently didn't exist at the Homer times. Um, I think that... that I think that even comes into Christianity as well. Like when we're reading the scriptures, there was no mention of, of hell. Like in the Old Testament, hell was like a state of consciousness upon the earth that an individual could walk in, right? It wasn't somewhere that you go when you die, going to hell or to the underworld. Oh, yes, yes. I agree. I perfectly agree. The, the, um, the separation between... Uh, Given and how good and bad is a question of uh, power. It's because human beings want power. They divided the two dimension in order to be able to um, to have control upon uh, nature and upon other. And um, you see, shamanism is a is a really great and powerful tool to overcome this separation. And if you are able to overcome this separation, your fear melt, melts, disappears. And uh, because fear is uh, <laughs> the cause, the very cause of many uh, diseases. Uh, and uh, sufferings, uh, so uh, melting, uh, um, melting fear is um, a really great thing that we can do um, in order to reappropriate our body and nature. We absolutely have to, um, to do something to help our bodies and nature in this time. And this is why I, I believe that uh, shamans and shamanic yoga in particular, which is my topic, um, can help a lot. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to get into now. So we're talking about nature and, and how to interact. But there are practices... Um, there's probably levels to it. There's some really deep ritualistic stuff. But then there's things that, that everyday people can do to interact as well right like shamanic yoga that's kind of a new term even for me we hear transcendental meditation and different types of, of yoga bhakti yoga and things like that but what's what what is shamanic yoga and what, what is that in, when you mention that term a shamanic yoga is a very primitive and animistic of course a form of yoga and it's about ecstasy uh, we can say that we do a shamanic yoga when we enter a state of ecstasy. And uh, in this state, which is a state of non-dual uh, consciousness, a state of uh, trance, um, a self-like, um, a trance-like state, I mean, uh, when we enter in this state, uh, we can do uh, yoga in a different manner. Uh, we do yoga postures, uh, we do breath control, meditation, all in this state of ecstasy, which is um, called uh, um, imaginal forest, sometimes also psychic forest. Um, so when we uh, practice a shamanic yoga, um, at the beginning, we enter the state of consciousness. We enter the imaginal forest. And once we are in, we practice yoga postures, breath control, meditation, 
all the yoga um, techniques and methods, but in a state of ecstasy, which is a non-dual state of consciousness, as I said. And um, this is how, how, how do you enter that state of ec ecstasy? Is it by doing the practice that gets you to this state, or is it something else that would get you to the ecstatic state first? Ah, we have different instruments. Um, uh, for instance, drumming, uh, music, uh, chanting, uh, um, uh, voice vibrations, uh, repeating a mantra. The mother mantra is very powerful. Nine repetitions of this mantra allow you to enter the um, ecstasy state. Um, uh, and also um, our, uh, our tools, we have our tools like uh, uh, active visualization, um, all the uh, tools of shamanic yoga are made, uh, we say, by sun experience and mother experience joined together. The mother experience uh, is a visualization experience and the sun experience is an energetic uh, and body um, experience. So in order to enter the imaginal forest, one has to um, uh, control the breath in order to rise the energetic level of, of the body and then um, also um, enter in a um, special particular visualization and uh, maybe singing, singing a mantra or playing a drum. This is very helpful as well. And once you are in, once you are in this state, you are exactly in the middle between uh, visible and invisible, between conscious and unconscious. This is the dimension that we call imaginal. Imaginal and not imaginary or something else, but imaginal. Imaginal is uh, the middle earth, is the space between visible and invisible, life and death, human and divine. And this where, where all our images, which become uh, um, thoughts, ideas, emotions, and then events, all the images which become events take place in this space, the imaginal. So you understand that being able to enter this space is the key to become the co-creator of reality. I like that. Um, I've always kind of... Uh went by the term shaman because it's one who's able to kind of bridge the two worlds and um like we're able to access those heightened states of consciousness to go into what we would call the trance state the dream state and get that image for ourselves our dreams our life's journey there's a lot of different names and stuff that people have given this their destiny scrolls whatever um, to commune with the higher power, to commune with God, their higher self, even go into those states, see that picture of what they are supposed to be doing, their purpose in life, and through these spiritual techniques, almost be able to pull it out of that etheric realm and embody it in the now moment. It's uh, almost a um, sense of manifestation, the law of attraction, even maybe the secret to be able to go into the trance state and be able to pull things out of that realm. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Every time you make the journey, something in, within you change, uh, changes uh, for, forever. And uh, you, every time you take uh, out something very important. But uh, what I want to say is that um, every moment in our life is a shamanic journey. Uh, but we have to be aware of that. For instance, when we eat, even when we breathe, when we uh, fall asleep, when we wake up, when we change our mood, we make a shamanic journey. We undertake a shamanic journey. You see, 
for instance, when we eat something, be it an apple, a carrot, um, we carry a life between one side to the other of a great threshold. And nobody can do that without uh, undertaking the journey himself, themselves, you see. Uh, so every time you eat something, you do a shamanic journey. But if you are not aware of that, you can't really take out <laughs> from this uh, action. You can really take out from uh, um, eating uh, what eating can give you. And this is why people nowadays uh, have a neurotic, a really neurotic relationship with food and eating. Because in our society, uh, which is a desacralized society, we have lost the ability to understand the real meanings, the real meaning of our action. Because we lost the invisible side of things, you see. <laughs> and uh, even when you, when you breathe, you, you, you take a journey. When you breathe out, you manifest everything that exists. And when you breathe in, you reabsorb or withdraw everything, all the projections, all the images, so, if you are really aware of your breath, you can see that life and death are simultaneously are intertwined. And if one can see clearly that life and death are intertwined, one <laughs> go beyond fear, you see, goes beyond fear. <laughs> And this is the key to live a, a fulfilled life. Don't you agree with you? Yes, definitely. I think it's also important. Um, you, you were you were saying earlier about the shaman being a bridge again. Uh, I think that, um, uh, and you were saying how um, being a bridge, he is able to. To, to lead you to, to, to that invisible dimension where you're able to realize um, a lot about your life. In that sense, the, 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 the shaman is even more, even more than a bridge. He's a, a, a creator in a certain sense of, of reality because um, you could even say that the, the, the role of a shaman is very close to that of, of a poet, in, in, especially in, in, in societies where poets do have a, a, an important purpose, like uh, I think of ancient Greek society, where I mean the word poet, after all, comes from comes from poiesis, which means uh, the cr creation, making something. No, um, the, the, the 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 poet was was a person who, in a certain sense, created reality, because just like a shaman, uh, a poet goes back to the mythical uh, uh, level of existence. Um, and um, and um, and it's what what my mom was saying in the sense that behind all actions in our life lies a myth, lies uh, to put it in psychological terms, an archetype. And um, and uh, and when when you go to Siberia, when you meet these shamans, you really understand that one of the most powerful tools that they have is storytelling. And um, shamanism, like all animistic tradition, is really strongly intertwined with mythology. In the case of shamanism, of course, with Turkic and Mongolian mythology. Um, but of course, shamans were very present in, in, in ancient Greek, uh, again, society, with, uh, with Orphism, etc., which was all uh, intertwined with, with Greek mythology. Um, uh, so yes, the, the, the shaman is a bridge, but he's also the, 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 the creator of, of, of a whole interpretation of existence. That's good. Yes, yes, I perfectly agree. Through the storytelling, through our inner narrative, we create our reality. Yeah. And through storytelling, we can change our reality. Well, just like we're talking about Homer, he created this hell. 
the the underworld and he gave you pictures and different levels of torment and different levels of uh, purging and you know those high, and it gave you a visual representation and essentially he created it for you because now it's an adopted thing and it's a part of our religions and things like that it's something that artistically he created you know he went into the ethers of the mind and pulled it out and now it's presenting it to you and it's become many people's truth right Yes. Not necessarily that it's good, you know. I'm not saying it's good, but he he created something like that, right? It's uh, you know, giving it to Christianity, like their concept of hell comes from that, you know. Yes, and that's the main thing. I think that uh, Greek, um, Greek the, the Greek mythological narrative, I think, still lies uh, uh, very much as as the Christian. Um, narrative lies at the, at the basis of our society at the basis of our moral system at the basis of even our metaphysical and and and, and a scientific even um view of, of 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 the world and and that is why going back to mythology going back to narratives is is really the key to understanding who we are and what we we are doing as individuals and as a, as a civilization yeah I think um, there's a resurgence now and we're having this conversation and, and many more people are, um, whether it's shamanism or just the Eastern traditions and spirituality, Native American spirituality as well. All this stuff's coming back. There's a scripture in the Bible that's really close to my heart and it talk, it says to go back and revisit the ancient path. And there at the ancient path, the ancient ways, you'll find rest for your souls, right? And um, so just going back to these ways that have been forgotten by, by society today and our ancestors practiced this. They knew about this type of communication. They knew about breath work and yoga and transcendental med meditation. So it's nothing new. It's very a resurgence of something very old. Um, what What are some of the ideas that come across through maybe even plant medicine. Is that something that, that you guys participate in? Because I know like from the shamanic tradition, they believe that the spirits behind the plants, they, they want to teach us as well. So the different plant teachers, uh, whether it be ayahuasca, psilocybin, mushrooms, and things like that, this really catching on now. And people are going to the Amazon. People are taking these trips to reconnect to their spiritual roots. So have do you guys practice the use of plant medicines at all? Yes, I personally practiced um, also that. I took ayahuasca and um uh, what I can say now is that um, in the medicine plants, uh, um, there is um, a spirit, uh, a forest uh, spirit of the, a, a spirit of the forest, and um, you see, in my opinion, uh, um, taking something from outside in order to enter a state of ecstasy, which is an amplified state of consciousness. Uh, could be useful, but um, only if you do that once. Twice is too much. <laughs> because uh, um, if, you, if you do it twice, it's because uh, you haven't uh, recognized the spirit being in you in the first time, you see. And so we di you, didn't, uh, you, you didn't really meet the spirit. Once you take um, a medicine plant, a spirit enter within you, and you have to recognize this and be able to understand that this is forever, and you don't need to do it twice. You don't need to do it twice. Once is enough. Um, one death is enough. <laughs> one, one birth is enough. One ayahuasca <laughs> is enough, you see. And um, yes, this is my opinion. Anyway, in shamanic yoga, we enter ecstasy. We enter amplified state of consciousness. And we undertake the... Um, shamanic journey absolutely without anything 
from outside. All the possibilities are within us and we undertake the journey through something that is within us. We don't need anything from outside. And it, it's very interesting because going uh, through, I mean, I don't have much experience of, of, of South America as my mom does, but going through, through Siberia, Central Asia, we, we, we would often ask uh, different shamans what they think about this. Now, because you would meet shamans that would do everything completely drunk, having drunk two bottles of vodka or, or smoking a pipe. Or you would meet a shaman who instead would say, absolutely not, you shouldn't be under the influx of any substance. Um, it's, it's blasphemous to, to, to consume any substance during a ritual. And what you come to realize is that the, the basic rule of, of, of shamanism is, is that there are no rules. The shamanism is, 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 is a very personal um, experience uh, and uh, every single sh shaman uh, plays his role as a shaman so um, uh, co connects with, with, with different worlds connects with the spirit in a very individual way in the way which works for him or her uh, just as the way in which they became shamans is very personal um, and um, and I think that that's, that's something important to take away, that the, the authentic uh, spiritual experience is something subjective. Uh, it's what works for you personally. Uh, and and what, what I really personally like about uh, shamanism is the fact that um, tr true shamanism emphasizes uh, the, 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 the idiosyncrasies, the, the, the specificities of the individual. Yes, yes, I perfectly agree. Um, I perfectly agree. I remember my shamanic yoga teacher when offered me um, a medicine plant. Before to do that, it brought me into the forest and uh, it told me, Selene, he asked me, who is breathing? Who is breathing? I start to thinking, oh my God, who is breathing? It's me. No, it's not me, I said to myself. Because when I breathe out, um, I emit, I emit CO2 and the trees breathe in my CO2. And why, while um, I'm breathing in, uh, trees produce um, oxygen and when I breathe in, I breathe in the oxygen that a tree produces. So who is breathing? Who is breathing? It's not me. And so I answered, it's not me. I don't know who is breathing, but it's not me. And so my teacher said, okay, you now you can take the plant. Now you can take the plant. Otherwise, <laughs> if, uh, if someone take a medicine plant, you see keeping his uh, or her consciousness within the sense of I, in the sense of I, if you are in the sense of your eye and you take a medicine plant, the result is that you burn some synapses. <laughs> First of all, you have to go out. You have to go out the walls of your eye. You have to go out the sense of your eye. You must be able to enter the inner space where mm, uh, outside, uh, inside, visible and invisible, individual and forest are distinct but not separated, you see. Once you are in this state of consciousness, then if you take a, a, a medicine plant, you do a proper journey. Uh, you don't run the risk to burn your synapses, <laughs> you see. <laughs> Otherwise, if you are uh, in, the, in the cage, if you are in the prison, 
of your eye and you take a medicine um, plant, you run a risk because you have fear. If you are in, a, in your sense of eye, you are in the fear. And if you are in the fear and you take a medicine plant, you run always a risk, a big risk. So better to be able to go out of the sense of eye before to take a medicine plant. That's good. Uh, we have a question here from the chat. Uh, Chris Garner wants to know, um, as far as this, the shamanic path is concerned, how do shamans view empathy and being empathetic, being able to feel the emotions of, you know, maybe not just people in spirits, but even the earth, feel the emotions of the earth and learn to sing that song and communicate healing that way. So do, do you guys talk about, you know, being um, empathetic at all, being able to feel the energies from that other people are sensing and stuff like that? Feel energy of the other people. <laughs> Yes, because you see, once you are beyond morals, which separate bad from good and um, evil from, uh, from good, when you are beyond morals, you acquire the power of inclusiveness. And um, a shaman is also someone who... <sighs> got the power of inclusiveness through, his, um, through the guide of uh, his or her uh, invisible lover, the guide spirit, the guide spirit, you see. And uh, be inclusive. Having the power of inclusiveness doesn't mean simply perceive the emotions of the other, but means being the others, you see. Uh, and, and even further than that, I think that what you're getting at is that shamanism tends to substitute a, a, an ethical perception of the world, that is, other people, but also, as you were saying, nature and, 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 and the cosmos in general, substitute the ethical perception of the world with a, an aesthetical an aesthetic perception of the world. Aesthetic doesn't mean beautiful, but going back to the original Greek root of the word, a, 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 a perception that puts at the center feeling, not uh, aesthetical as the opposite of anesthetical. No? And, um, and so uh, they, 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 um, they, 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 they change completely the narrative of which we see things. Now, for example, now the, the, the burning of, of forests in the Arctic or the Amazon rainforest, uh, um, um, we, we, we see it as a, as a biodiversity or ecological disaster. We see it as, as the loss of uh, the, the people who, who um, put it in terms of economical loss. Uh, uh, what, what the shamans say and what, what the shamans have been saying in Siberia, for example, is, is that uh, no, the, the, the forests are crying, the forests are dying, no, in a way as if to, 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 to sort of personalize uh, the, the, these forests, uh, uh, talking to them about them as if they were people no, with, with emotions such as ours. Um, I feel that that, that, that is, 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 is really an aesthetic perception of, 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 of the world. Am I, am, am I right in saying that? Absolutely, absolutely. We always say in um, shamanic yoga, shamanic path, that aesthetic experience is the great alternative to therapeutic model. If the therapeutic model is seen to be the only go-to solutions for all kind of problem, we can't see that there is an alternative, which is not uh, uh, an alternative therapy, but which is an alternative to therapy, you see. Uh, because therapy is an anesthetic, anesthetic path, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic experience, uh, which is also an aesthetic, a poetic experience, which is a shamanic experience. 
is the experience of inclusiveness. Which is, which is bringing back the soul to everything. No, my mom began by saying, we live in a desacralized world. And I believe that this shift from ethic to aesthetic, this saying the forest is dying, the forest is crying, is a bringing back of the soul into, into, into everything, to that world which, which, which we've objectified and which we have therefore subjected to um, considerations of a purely economic kind. Yes, and I think that this um, uh, encounters also the um, true Christianity, the Christianity of the origin. You see, um, at the beginning, Abil and Cain were brothers, and to be brothers in the myth means to be two faces of the same reality, <laughs> two faces of the same reality. But <laughs> after that, uh, you see, um, uh, everything went lost because uh, human beings want power. And in order to have power, in order to have control, you have absolutely to separate and divide bad from good. And um, this is not in nature. Nature, as uh, um, he said, uh, as my son said, nature has uh, an horizontal perspective and not a vertical one like the mind has. That's good. What is the mother mantra? It's a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very powerful mantra. It's a vibration. It's a vibration. Uh, you see, um, they used, they habitus, they used to put uh, the centrality of the awareness in the, in, in the eye, in the sense of eye is um, um, a very habit of our civilization. And um, how one can go beyond that is not easy because uh, um, the conditionment is very um, deep in ourselves. So we have to go deep down in order to cleanse the conditionment. And uh, we have to reach um, our organs uh, because the conditionment is in our organs, uh, is in our body. We have to, um, to go very deep down. And uh, through a mantra, we can do that. Because a mantra is a vibration. And through a vibration of the mantra, we can reach um, the the mind of the cells, which is a vibrational form of consciousness. And um, a mantra is a very powerful tool. And, um, but the mother mantra tradition is not only the repetition of the mantra. Uh, the mantra mantra tradition, as I said before, is the um, uh, core of shamanic yoga teachings and uh, is uh, the tradition of the mystical marriage. Many um, practices uh, and uh, healing exercises are known in this tradition. And uh, all these practices and healing exercises are uh, done um, with, the, with the company of our guide spirit, uh, we, uh, which is seen as a, a bride or a groom, as an invisible lover in the shamanic traditions of the world. And uh, in my book, um, all these practices and healing exercises are well described. So through the book, uh, um, I think people can do a lot. Um, and if it is not enough, they can uh, go on my website, for instance. And uh, on my website, um, uh, selenecalloniwilliams.com, um, there are a lot of... Uh, Mm, 
webinars, uh, free webinars uh, and videos uh, in which I describe uh, how to do, how to enter the imaginal forest, how to practice the healing exercises, uh, how to enter the mystical marriage and, uh, and so on. I think there are very powerful tools, uh, very necessary um, nowadays. Uh, for the present human beings. Awesome. Yeah, it's really good work. And thank you so much for coming on. I got another question for your son. When's your book coming out? My book? <laughs> well, now I'm starting some research on, on, on Central Asian shamanism at Cambridge. And, uh, and we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll end up writing a book. <laughs> Be awesome, man. Yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Again, Celine, your website is CelineColonWilliams.com. And there you can uh, check out the book. And you have a bunch of resources and teachings and stuff on your website. Your website's re really well made. So, yeah, make sure everybody, you guys, uh, head on over there. Check out the book and everything that she has as well. So is there anything that we didn't cover that you guys wanted to, to, uh, to speak on, man, before we go? Anything else? Anything else? There's too much. There's too much that could be. <laughs> yeah, that's too, that's too much, really. That's too much. Really. I think we did a great overview, just touching on a lot of different subjects and just kind of giving an over overview about what shamanism is and to not to be scared of it. And you know, we do have a, a, a decent sized Christian audience here, and it's awesome to kind of bridge the gap even there to let them know that their founder. <laughs> Jesus was a shaman as well, one who was very well uh, versed in working with the spirits and, and back and forth between the worlds, quite literally even, right? Yes, yes. I could say something about uh, Gnosticism, which, um, which was and is also the um, Christianity, the esoteric uh, Christianity. In the esoteric Christianity, you see, um, we can find uh, the mystical marriage image too. Um, and it's the marriage between Christ and uh, Sophia. Sophia. Yes. Um, Sophia, um, the word Sophia in Greek means knowledge, and Christ is love. Christ and Sophia have never to be divided. They have always to be together in every one of us, you see. If we divided the knowledge from love, then we have trouble. <laughs> and Jesus is a, a really great master, a really great teacher uh, who can uh, teach us how to do, to keep wisdom, wisdom and love, wisdom and love always together. In our, in our society, because it's a desacralized society, who knows, the one who knows doesn't have a power. And the, the one um, who have power doesn't know. Yes, it's true, there is a, a knowledge of the power, but is, uh, or, there is a such knowledge of uh, the one who has a power, but is a technical knowledge, is a strategic knowledge. And uh, the one who knows doesn't have power because uh, he is a true, a truth seeker, you see, and he is interested um, in, uh, uh, in seeking the truth and not in the power. <laughs> this is why um, this, this division, this separation between uh, knowledge and power in our civilization is a really great problem. In my opinion, we need uh, that person who has knowledge are also willing to get power and to guide a society to a new, different dimension, which must be absolutely the dimension of love. We need uh, leaders in our society who are able not only 
to have a technical, strategical knowledge, but who are able to love and to think through love. We need that, and we need that urgently, you see, urgently. Someone like Donald Trump. (laughs) (laughs) I'm joking. (laughs) The quite opposite of what you just said, you know. You know, I I find it funny because uh, Joe Rogan from the Joe Rogan podcast, he says that he thinks that all the leaders need to get up and do mushrooms together and then let them experience eternity. Let them experience the heights of the heavens and the depths of hell and let them see what reality really is. And then they will come back more loving, more empathetic and more ready to serve people versus serve the big pharma companies and the big oil industries and things like that. So that's his say. That's all we need to do. Just get them all together and let the plants teach them. Right. I think it would change their lives. Right. I don't know if it would happen in a perfect world. It would. But um, I thought that was interesting that he said that. To get together and do shamanic yoga, I think. <laughs> Sounds awesome. So do do um so in the book there's some techniques and things that you give. Are there any videos and stuff on the website that actually show you guys doing the practice and stuff as well? Yes, yes, yes. On my website and on my YouTube channel there are a lot of videos uh, um, about my healing practices. Uh, and uh, people can can practice uh, um, looking at the videos. Uh, it's very it's very easy. Shamanic yoga is a very easy way of doing yoga because it's a very ancient yoga, and so um, it's simple. Uh, you see, when you go back in time, you reach a simple, very simple. Uh, yeah, thing. that's good stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, I love it, and I'm, I'm very all the practices that you that you said. I like to accompany as well. We talk about, yeah, you know, I'm a poet as well. So what I bring to the table in creating these realms and these mystical experiences through through my music, and um, and, it, it, and we talk about the power of it, and other people listen to the music. And it allows them to kind of journey and go on those experiences as well, and uh, which is really interesting, the power of the poet or the creator, as you said. And it's definitely, we have the music, the music raises vibration or puts you in a a trance state anyway, and then you have the lyrics and the intention and everything, and the sounds and the the different frequencies, even in them, I put theta waves and... uh, binarial beats and things like that it creates for a beautiful you know experience through meditation as well so that's awesome you mentioned that of course i mean the the most important tool of any shaman is is the drum definitely uh, singing uh, with, with 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 a drum is is, is at the center is is the way in which a shaman reaches that state that my mom calls ecstasy that trance like state through through music through rhythm definitely yeah. It's the, the drum, but that's just the beginning, right? You have the drum, you maybe have incense, you maybe have the breath work, the visualization, all combined together. The beautiful thing is, which I, the reason I, I like this indigenous path, which more people are going back to, is because you don't need anything outside of you. And that's even the thing with the... Um, the plant medicines is you have to seek something outside of yourself to get you in that state when really everything is already within your breathing techniques, your vis- visualization, chanting mantras. It's all things that we can do by ourselves and we don't need anything outside of ourselves, which is the really cool part about the, the spiritual path of the, the of the uh, the ancients. And I believe Jesus taught that, too. Right. Obviously, what we have in Christianity is something totally different than what Jesus brought to the table but that's where the power really lies in is that we all can enter in wherever we are no matter what belief system we have these practices they're no respecter of persons right they work for everybody right yes 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 i am i feel the jesus um figure uh, image very close by me Uh, and um, you see um, I come from a very um, Christianity um, uh, terrain environment. Uh, I have a grandmom who was a shaman and a 
she was uh, so Christian and uh, so close by Jesus. Uh, and so um, I realized uh, since I was very young that uh, we also, Western people, we have a shamanic strong traditions which goes through Christianity. And uh, um, now I think that we, we must be able to recover, to remember this tradition. It's very useful for us, for nature, and for, for, for Christianity as well, because uh, we have, uh, um, I think we, we have to um, help Christianity to remember its origin mm -hmm. and to uh, get rid of uh, um, dogma. All, yes. Institution. Get rid of all that uh, yeah. uh, institution have uh, uh, done. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my assignment, you know, and I, I work in the Christian realm somewhat. And um, going back, just reading the Bible and just seeing how in touch these people were with the spirit world. I mean, they were interacting with angels. They were going into trance state. They were fasting and just only eating plants and vegetables for a prolonged period of time. And in the midst of doing that, they would meet with angels and things like that. So the Bible is full of these beautiful encounters and, and experiences that to me you enter those states through shamanic yoga, right? You There's the, 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 the spiritual practice and the spiritual beliefs of the ancients, right? I think, you know, they don't, it doesn't say that, but it doesn't use that term right in the Bible. But I think some of the things that they were doing and, and walking in a spirit of love and knowing that love was the highest form of vibration and, and, and doing that and being able to conquer your fears and transcend the lower levels of reality and things like that. So... It's it's really beautiful, when, like you said, being able to help Christianity remember who they were, not become something different, but just remember who you were. Just remember, yes. But you think at the Eucharistia, um, Eucharistia um, is a shamanic ritual. You eat the uh, body Christ, the Christ of the body of Christ, and you drink the blood of Christ. This is a shamanic ritual, you see. In shamanism, um, a similar ritual is well known since the times of the origin, since the very ancient time, shamans perform uh, such a ritual um, because they are perfectly aware that uh, um, Christ is everywhere everywhere love is uh, christ is and uh, so if you eat an apple which gives itself for you if you eat uh, um, a tomato or a carrot which gives its life for you so what you eat at the end what you eat at the end you eat love you yeah. eat love so everything everything we can eat is love everything we can eat is christ everything we can drink is love everything we can drink is christ and we have polluted water we have a uh, contaminated food that means that we have contaminated christ we have contaminated water we have contaminated our idea of God. We have contaminated our feeling of love and we have to cleanse, cleanse it. We, and this means that we have to remember the origins. We have to remember the, <laughs> the beginning, you see, um, of our faith. Our faith yeah, that's, that's so good. Yes, I think that faith is the greatest power of human being. Faith and love are two faces of the same reality. And faith, love, love, faith is the greatest power of human beings. 
if you if you can remember this power you have everything you don't need anything else motivation productivity uh, cleverness uh, are all <laughs> Uh, all invention, you see, all, uh, um, yes, invention of uh, illusion of the mind. Uh, we have only one great power, which is faith and love. Faith, love. <laughs> <laughs> and if we recover, if we remember this power, we, we don't need anything else. We have everything. We have the freedom. And in freedom, everything is included. Um, um, wellness, uh, um, richness uh, um, are all aspects of freedom. We must be free. And in order to be free, we need to remember our power of faith and love. We need to remember Jesus Christ. I love it. Well, Celine, thank you for coming on, you and your son. I enjoyed your presence as well, man. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Really enjoyed this episode again right here at the last moment. Let's go ahead and plug your website again one more time for everybody. Celine Caloni. Ah, website, yes. <laughs> Celine com. Which is S E L E N E Caloni. C A A L O N I Williams dot com. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, guys. Thanks so much, man. I I I'd love to have y'all back on again. Thanks so much. Thanks Thank a lot. you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right. Many blessings. Bye bye. Loved it. Celine Colony Williams and her son. Gr great addition to the podcast. Uh man, loved it. Just talking about returning again to the ancient path, man shamanic yoga um it almost seems like just all of the in, indigenous spirituality combined right so i think i think in some some ways we're all students of shamanic yoga or we're all influenced by it right there's many different types of yoga mindfulness for yoga kundalini yoga but i think it encompasses a little bit of all of it the rhythm of the drum puts me under hypnosis Anointed by the fire of tongues that's clo cloven. Hebrews, mystics, prophets, chosen. Share it with the world. Now truth is spoken. The drums, man, all of these things, you know, and, and, and I've been telling people recently, just trying to introduce them to breath work and how powerful that is and putting that in, uh, trying that with your meditations and with your, your closet time and things like that. But the drums, the drums and the rhythm and then getting your body and your spine in motion and in rhythm with the drums as well uh, is so powerful. Uh, man, the new Tool CD <clears throat> album just got leaked. Fear Inoculum comes out in four days, but it's leaked and I got to listen to it some this morning. <clears throat> and then uh, it's amazing. The uh, the music um, is Every song is is over ten minutes, and it's almost like a um, uh, spiritual experience in and of itself that you can put on and go in. So if you listen to this album, like, and you meditate, close your eyes, and go within, move your body, do some of the different kriyas and some of the different bodily positions with the breath work. I mean, f the n number two on the album is a song called Numa, which is about the sacred breath and returning to the the breath and remembering the breath. Don't forget the breath, guys. Right? Uh, embrace. Listen to that song while doing breathing exercises oh my goodness it that in and of itself is a spiritual experience and so the new tool that the new tool album is a tool for us to enter those states man it's awesome because the different timing signatures and the, the 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 lyrics that are being spoken the tones man it is so beautiful so that's how that's something that we could we can embrace i'd love to do that with a group of people just go and meditate and listen to that freaking album man the timing signatures the drums Man, there's and it, it's an experience. It's a roller coaster of just the really soft tones, and then taking you onto some different heavier melodies and stuff like that. So it's really beautiful. Um, embracing all of it. I don't think that there's one that's greater than the other. I don't think that there's 
Uh, I don't think that you even have to do them all together, but it's like the more the merrier, right? You got your incense burning. You got some crystals around you. You got, you know, you have the aromatherapy with the incense, light healing, right? You got your light on with you. Put on some good healing light, some green light, green light meditation. Oh, man, the frequencies and tones that you're listening to in your meditation. And then the drums and then the chanting, chanting the, the, the ohms or the ums. Um, or the different mantras again she's talking about the mother mantra is the name of her book uh another mantra that is really beautiful near and dear to my heart is the um mantra um rama dasa rama dasa sase so hung there's different ways that you can do it i'm not the best at doing those mantras in a group of people i really don't like to to hear the sound of my voice doing that back because i don't think i'm that good at it but when i'm by myself and I tap in by myself and I'm doing these mantras, even if it's just doing the OM mantras, doing it in a three part syllable, the uh, um, three different parts, you can feel it. The I uh starts off in the stomach and you're vibrating the um, the the O is, is more in the throat and then the M mm is all in the face and you can feel it stimulating the third eye. You can feel it stimulating the third eye, the pineal gland. So if you you have all that stuff and you combined it, you're trying to leave your body, there you go. All the tools are there. You're trying to meet with God, there you go. Trying to encounter angels, summon UFOs, there you go. You create it with the imaginal force of the mind. And then it becomes reality. It's different if it's just strong delusion and you're just uh, imagining things that aren't there. But when it... It almost all is just not there, right? Because there's no proof until it crosses the threshold into this reality. Now we've done something. You're summoning UFOs. People think you're crazy. Wait, one peered through. One showed up. Okay, hold on. Something's happening. You're out there trying to summon UFOs, praying for angels to show up. And it's just this weird place in the mind that you're like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to engage this to see if there's anything there. Then it shows up. You're meeting with angels in the etheric realm who are giving you blessings or whispering wisdom to you. But then it shows up in your waking state. You were able as a shaman to go into the, that realm and pull something out. You were able to bid the angels to show up and they made an appearance. Again, with the with the dualistic nature of everything, there's there's pros and cons there's good and bad right be careful don't get caught up in the worshiping of angels as some have who has so easily bewitched you from the simplicity of the gospel right there's these things these warnings these checks that we got to make sure that we're not so far out there that we're so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good but the shaman the mystic, someone who stands in the in the in the gap, in the threshold between heaven and earth and is a bridge of the two, which is through the the Christian mystic would approach that through Christ and what he did. And he torn the veil that we can freely travel, that we can freely have access to the father. And we don't need to go to a pastor. We don't need to go to a uh, an, an altar, but we create an altar within our own heart and within our own homes and within our own sacred space that God comes in and fills the temple. How? <sighs> Through the breath, experiencing God and as close as your next breath and being able to feel the Holy Spirit, to be able to be at one, to be meditating with your feet on the ground, sitting out in nature, the cool breeze blowing against your face and you can you're tra you're immediately transported back to that place where Adam walked with God in the cool of the day and then you're not just at one with yourself you're not just at one with your family and your friends and the other believers you're at one with all of creation the birds the insects the worms they're communicating you learn their song it moves on it, it becomes it gets a lot bigger. Your spirituality, your theology gets a lot more inclusive. And you see how small you really are in this whole scape of things and how everything is meant to be here. Everything exists for a reason. And you feel the wind blow and you look at the trees and the wind just begins to move through the trees. And it almost is like an entity that's pushing the trees. 
these experiences, man, that we were talking about just Sunday morning on our SEER classes. Like we just was getting into some really deep conversation and, um, you know, we can talk about this stuff. And I know that talking, just like the brother said, how the, uh, the poet, you know, is creating it and it's creating something within people when they hear this, they're just, they want more. They're wanting to draw away. I mean, I look at my music and it's all there. You know, but it's it, it hits different individuals differently. Some people hear it, turn it off. I don't like it. I don't believe it. I don't even know what you're talking about. You're making up. You're making it up as you go. Some people say that. Other people would, would hear it and be like, man, it, it ignites something within them to go outside to begin to stargaze, to go and book a flight to um, wa- Trout Lake, Washington, to uh, go to James Gilliland's East Seti Ranch and go have an encounter there for themselves, to book a a, a shaman, to book a, a session with a, a Reiki master or a healer or a one-on-one session over the internet, whatever it is, man, but just to kind of step out. It's unlocking things within you as we're dealing with energy as we're dealing with the language of light the higher vibration of love it's all it's all love she said faith and love the two highest right they complement one another one doesn't exist without the other the bible says that faith uh that love is what fuels your faith love is is like your faith in action Right. It's not just having faith of just believing in the unseen, but it's about walking in it and doing something. Well, we believe in angels. Yeah, we believe in demons. But have you engaged them? Have you seen them? You can. All of this stuff is possible and more. And it is embraced through what we've talked about today. Shamanic yoga. These rituals. Everybody wants the terms and traditions. You know, they want to own it. I've, this is mine. This is ours. I want to put a distinction between the two. This is universal. Hero Israel, the Lord is one. God is not divided. He is in both realms. The good, the bad, the ugly. I'm the Lord thy God. I create light and darkness is what the scripture says. But you but there and there is no dis, there's no difference, but you need the two. There is not one without the other. The yin and the yang, they're both together. The good and the bad. Learn to rejoice within both. As the apostle Paul said, I am content. I could do all things through Christ. No matter what season of his life that he's in, he knows that it's all working together for his good. And that's what we need to uh needs to be imparted to us a level of gratitude so strong that uh, nothing can pull you off of that path. Nothing can uh, deter you off of the road that God has put you on and God has called you to. Yeah, there's trials, there's tribulations, there's doubt, there's fears, there's all these things, but they all work together for your good. Working and building and releasing something in you that can't be bought. They tried to buy the gift of God. They tried to buy the Holy Spirit. It can't be bought. This is something that's going to take a lifetime to cultivate, a lifetime to walk in. And, and, and as you maintain it and you work with it in the different levels and complexities and the different points of view of the Holy Spirit and of God's plan for your life, you're able to see it in everything. Working for your good in everything. Not just the good things, the fun times. Without the bad times, there are no fun times. You, you have no, uh, you have no contrast there. There's nothing to compare it to. You don't know what the light is until you've sat in utter darkness. Thank God for the darkness. Thank God for the light. For all of it, this beautiful journey, which God, the Father, is the author and the finisher of our faith. This is beautifully written out. Your, your, your path is beautifully written. There's a plan and a purpose for you. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Get with the author of that plan. Get with the one who wrote it. How? First of all, we, we get to it through love itself, which is Jesus, right? But then the practice, the spiritual practice. Do the same things Jesus did. Shamanic yoga. The trance state. Singing, worship, look all through, it's all throughout the scriptures, man. I try my best to, to give you examples and bring this stuff out. But it is, a, it is attainable for everyone. And, the, and as much as you're willing and able to believe God for, it's available. It's possible. That's how. Like, you know, that's between you and God. 
You know, if, if the Bible says that whatsoever you believe, it'll be given to you according to your faith, according to your faith, not my faith. Nothing shall by any means be impossible unto you. Well, what's that nothing? Well, nothing is different for each one of us. That nothing is different. Nothing to you may be trying to heal your ancestral path. Nothing for me may be trying to pay the bills this month. Nothing for someone else is restoring a marriage. This is nothing shall by any means be impossible unto you. It will be given to you according to your faith, according to the way that you believe. Nothing is impossible. All things are possible. For he has turned our mourning into dancing, our sorrow into joy, our night into day. Believe God for it, man. And he's got you this far, but he's got greater things in store. Your best days are ahead of you. Believe it. That's the Bible. Believe it. It's for you. Prophesy to your life, guys. Man, I really enjoyed this talk. It was really good. Um, the indigenous path, and I'm... Um, Stepping a little bit closer into mine uh, as well. And uh, I, I'm, I'm having fun doing it and uh, remembering it. See, I, we get we get caught up sometimes and we, you know, I, I've said this many times. I don't learn anymore. I'm just kind of trying to articulate and teach the things that I've spent years learning. Well, you know what? We all have to tap in through practice. And so that's what we do on the Sunday seer class and the the Thursday night School of the Mystics. We do that together as a body, as a group, and it's beautiful. So make sure you guys uh, check that out, what we bring to the table via our Patreon. Small group, you're looking for people who are like-minded, patreon.com backslash truthseeker. If you believe in the work, please support. Any level of giving means the world to me. Let's me know that you believe in and you sign up and get access to all kinds of, of things. It's really, it's cool because even if it's a dollar, you get your privy to the email list, which to pay for an email list that size, it gets expensive. So you get your privy to a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just the music. It's just not the seer class or the school of the mystics. It's a whole bunch of stuff. So thank you guys for believing in my work again, September the 14th, the Christ consciousness conference in Mobile, Alabama. If you want to meet me, you want to have dinner. I'm, it's going to be that type of event. It's going to be intimate. And depending on how this one goes, it's going to move forward if we do more. So we may do some, I, I've, I've, once the weather gets a little bit cooler, I already have something else in mind to do. But uh, we'll see how this goes, man. I'm excited for it. Even if it's only a couple people who show up, we're going to go after it. We're going to go in together. And uh, pretty much any, everything that we talked about today, we're going to be doing that and more. So with that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. Truthseeker.com, patreon.com, backslash truthseeker. Thank you, guys. Love each and every one of y'all. We'll do it again tomorrow, actually. Peace, peace. Yo, That does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.